Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elaine Smith, and as Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm delighted to welcome you here uh, to the Scottish Parliament and the 8th Annual St Andrew's Day Debate. Today's debate and, of course, the wider competition that preceded it um, have been organised in partnership with Education Scotland and the English Speaking Union. Sorry, could you all take a seat? <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> I usually sit down and everyone sits down. Um, I want to start by expressing my thanks to everyone <clears throat> involved from both of those organisations for their hard work and efforts which culminate in today's event. Today you are in the debating chamber that usually serves as the place where our devolved legislation is enacted. And it can be a challenge at times, I have to say, presiding over the proceedings in this chamber. Sometimes the debates are passionate, sometimes they are controversial. And sometimes consensus even breaks out with all sides agreeing that a piece of legislation is too important for a uh, part of political division. Whatever the debate, the parliamentarians are professionals and so the bar is set high here in our seat of government. So there's a high standard set, but I've always been very impressed with the extremely high standard of debating demonstrated by the finalists in this competition. And who knows? Maybe we have some future MSPs and ministers here amongst you today. In fact, only last week during a debate in this chamber, Jackie Bailey recalled a visit to a school where she met a schoolboy who is now the newly appointed Minister for Local Government and Community Empowerment, Marco Biaggi, MSP. And in the same debate, the First Minister spoke of another government minister, Hamza Yusuf, MSP, who recalled that the first time he met her was when she visited his modern studies class. So I've got high hopes for some of you who are here today. The unique style that the St Andrews Day debate offers in its pairing of students from our schools and universities is clearly a successful formula since the contest continues to go from strength to strength. And I was reliably informed just before starting that this year is in fact the best ever. The Scottish Parliament is always pleased to host this competition as it not only affords the opportunity for students and pupils to debate in the chamber, but it also provides us with an appropriate way of marking St Andrew's Day. Patron saints are a tradition which comes from Orthodox and Christian churches, and saints often become the patrons of places where they were born or had been active or where relics remain. And St Andrew's relics are in St Mary's Cathedral here in Edinburgh, and this also provides Scotland with a special link to Amalfi in Italy and Patras in Greece, where two cathedrals named after the saint also hold his relics. There are many St Andrew's Day societies worldwide, and these were set up originally as self-help organisations for Scots who had fallen in hard times, and they now form a network of Scots who are all united under the saltire cross of St Andrew. And they give Scotland a European and worldwide dimension and they include societies in places such as Bermuda and Washington, D.C. And closer to home, more and more of our Scottish towns and cities are using St Andrew's Day as a platform to launch winter festivals and celebrations to get us all through the cold, dreary winter months. And today, of course, as we look outside, we can see the cold and dreary weather has started already. However, in here, it's a lot brighter as the chamber floor has been given over to some of Scotland's most talented young debaters. I wish our finalists the very best of luck and also good luck to everyone who will be taking part in the open debate, which I'll come to a bit later. And finally, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone in the galleries, friends, classmates, teachers and family, and to those watching live on Glow TV in classrooms around the country. I hope you enjoy this afternoon's debate and I hope you enjoy your visit to your Scottish Parliament. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, before I introduce the finalists, I would like to introduce to you our panel of judges. Chairing the judging panel will be Alec Orr. I don't know if you'd like to just stand up, Alec, or <laughs> introduce yourself. Thank you. Alec is the Managing Director of Orbit Communications, a public relations and public affairs consultancy. 
He is a member of the National Executive Committee of the Scottish National Party and is a board member of the European Movement and Vice Chairman of ESU Scotland. We also have with us Adam Bernstein, President of the Scottish Students' Debating Council. Adam. Thank you. Adam has spoken. <laughs> Adam has spoken in finals of multiple national competitions and is a third-year politics student at the University of Edinburgh. We also have with us Ian McGill, who is the Conservative candidate for Edinburgh Central in the forthcoming Westminster elections. As well as campaigning in local issues in the Lothian region, he is also a director of the Harmony Employment Agency, which specialises in the social care sector. And also with us today is Robin Harper. Robin. <coughs> Robin was a teacher of modern studies for some 37 years prior to his election to the Scottish Parliament in 1999, where he not only became the first Scottish Green Party MSP, um, but he was also the first UK Green Parliamentarian. And since I was also elected in 1999, we were colleagues at that time. And Robin is a former president of the Royal Scottish Society of Arts and is now chairman of the Scottish Wildlife Trust. Welcome. So I have one more judge, last but not least, to introduce to you. The St Andrews Day debate encourages pupils to join the judging, <coughs> sorry, to join the judging panel and uh, panels for all the debates held throughout this event. So I'm absolutely delighted that today we can welcome Victoria Groom of Mairns Castle High School in Newton Mairns, Glasgow, as the last member of our panel of judges. Just a wee bit more information about Victoria. She's an ESU Juniors Debating Competition Champion and, uh, as well as a prominent school debater, she's actively involved with the work of Amnesty International. And we now move on to congratulate and introduce the four teams that have made it through today to the final this evening. They are David McCreath from Edinburgh University and Ailey McCreath from Aberdeen Grammar School. And they will be known as... Aberdeen McCreath. So welcome. <laughs> and we also have Chris Edgar from Glasgow University and Luke Lanares, hope I've got that pronunciation right, from St Andrews and St Bride's School and will be known as St Andrews and St Bride's Edgar. We now have Joe Dyer from Strathclyde University and Martin Monaghan from Hindland Secondary School, and they will be known as Hindland Dyer. <laughs> and finally, we have Alex Dawn from St Andrews University and Peter Hurston from Linlithgow Academy, and that team will be known as Linlithgow Dawn. So, before we begin, I would like to outline the format of the debate. I will call on the first proposition to speak, and they will have seven minutes. I will then call on the first opposition speaker to speak, and they will also have seven minutes, and that is repeated with each of the speakers thereafter. During the eight speeches, I will verbally announce when the first minute is up, hopefully, <laughs> And that will indicate that points of information are now permitted. I will rely on my colleagues to make sure that we do that when the first minute is up. I will also verbally indicate then when you have entered your last minute, and at that point, no more points of information will be allowed. When your seven minutes are up, I will ask you to wind up, and if you continue further, I will ask again for you to wind up after 30 seconds. I am not sure if I meant to cut you off cold, but I am sure you will all stick to the timings. Because, as you might know, my role as Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm tasked with keeping the members of the Scottish Parliament to time when they're speaking in the chamber. I'm not very keen on cutting them off, but sometimes there's no other option if we're running out of time. But I trust this debate will um, be conducted with everyone keeping to their times. Please use the clocks round the chamber for reference, because these will be timing you, so you can use those. After the final speech for the opposition, I'm going to ask our panel of judges to retire to make their decision, and at that point I am going to open up the debate to the floor for 20 minutes. I hope that as many people as possible will be able to participate in the floor debate, because there is going to be an award for the best contribution from the floor, so there is some motivation there for you to try and contribute at that point. 
So the motion today is, this House believes that governments should prioritise economically productive public spending over humanities and the arts when deciding budgets. So on to the final, and I wish you all the best of luck. The first speaker is the, uh, so I want to call the first speaker from Aberdeen McCreath to open the debate as the first proposition speaker, please. Across much of the north of England and many areas of Scotland, there are thousands of people living in communities with poor job prospects, poor housing, low educational opportunities and a genuine feeling of disconnect from the central government. Ladies and gentlemen, Chairperson, in a world of debating, we are lucky to have the luxury of being able to talk about abstract terms, about value to individuals of culture and art. However, we think that the reality is that what people in tough circumstances will care about is um, important services which are fundamental to their lives and how they live those lives. Okay? We think that given the, that the case that we bring an opening is um, given that all governments have to prioritise scarce resources, we think that they should do it in a way which gives the greatest benefit and resources to this particular group in society and to society in general. So today in my speech I'm going to be talking about the role of the state in this model and why it is the state's duty to prioritise economic economically productive public spending over humanities and arts degrees. Firstly, mechanism. So One we're minute. not advocating a complete like cutting of arts and humanities, right? We think that under this motion you're likely to see like of substantially more spending on economically productive things. We would define these as things like infrastructures, things like creating business incentives, like the education system and building homes. We think you're looking at the types of things um, types of investments where you can like measure the costs of them and where you can also also measure the, be the benefits of them in a way that you can't always do with arts and humanities. So what will... Sh no, thanks. So, oh, yes, please. Insofar as we're talking about your burden and a proportional shift, what number or percentage of spending currently on arts would be going towards... Uh, infrastructure projects. Okay, right. Like, we, like we don't think that's the majority part of this um, debate. Like, we don't think we need to give you certain numbers. We think it would just be that you see a substantial more amount being spent on economic spending and less spent on arts and humanities. We don't think the actual number is of significance. Like, we just don't think that's important. So, they, they think what we'll show you today is why it's more important for the governments to prioritise spending in order to benefit those who need it most. So, firstly, let's look at role of the state. So, firstly, we think that states always inherently have restricted resources to spend things on. So, we think the states will always have to make decisions between what to fund and what they don't fund, right? We think the opportunity cost to everything the state decides to fund, like we think there's always something the state won't be able to fund or won't be able to fund to the same extent as other things, right? So we think that given that the state is a collective entity, which is, um, which through the use of force, like, takes money from people, in, like, through taxes to be used on public spending, right? We think that the state should implement some sort of funding structure which lowers the effects of opportunity costs as much as possible, right? We think that that's the role of the state. We think that's a really important part of analysis. So we think that given that, in what ways do you minimise effects of opportunity cost? So firstly, we think the government should prioritise spending that delivers benefit to the largest majority of people possible. So we think, why does economically productive spending fall under this? A, we think it has like, the objective measurable returns that we've already talked about. So we think that it's possible to assess the cost of that and the benefit of that. We think it's difficult to do this with arts and humanities because they're so subjective, right? So we think that therefore it only has benefit for a select amount of people, right? We don't think that the benefits are to like, a broad number of society, right? So we think that economically productive spending has much more benefits in return for the taxpayer, right? We think that generally this kind of spending benefits a substantial amount of people, right? We think that's important. Secondly, we think that the state has to provide services which would be difficult to fund without it, right? We think that infrastructure, things like infrastructure are extremely hard to um, be provided for by companies of less resources than the government does, right? We think that that's much more difficult. And we think equally, ladies and gentlemen, it's harmful to hand these responsibilities to private sectors because we think that often then you don't get the benefits of these services back to the taxpayer, which we think is an important part of this debate, right? So we think that even though we recognise that arts requires like funding, we think that it has more capacity to fund, people have more capacity to fund this for areas to flourish, like within communities and organisations. Like we bring in the example that lots of art galleries have like patrons that they can go, rich patrons that they can go to for funds. We think things like, things like that are much more likely under arts and humanities areas. 
Finally, we think that while arts like, do provide benefits in terms of like, things like self-reflection, we think that at the end of the day, government should be able to prioritise physical resources which allow people to function, right? We think this is fundamental. We think that even if you have like, some government spending, we think people with resources are better able to achieve that art and, like, through economically productive um, spending, because we think that brings that resources and it brings the government's ability to fund arts better. So secondly then, why, um, why will this be perceived as misallocations? Why perceived misallocations to the arts can be damaging to these arts and humanities subjects, right? I think this is the second part of analysis I'm going to bring. So firstly, we think there are certain things like about art, certain things that appeal to different people. We think that the arts, the value of an art is subjective, right? So we think, like, for example, if you're like a white male living in the US, you'll get comparatively less benefit from a display of, like, for example, like African-American like, culture than a, than a black person's going to, right? So we think that that's much more likely. Secondly, general Oops. perception... So, Apologies, yeah. I'll give you a bit of extra time. I shouted final minute and it okay. wasn't. Okay. Secondly, secondly, perception that arts um, is quite an elitist thing, all right? Um, so I think this is to um, some extent based on like reality, right? We think that, for example, things like opera are much, and going to see a symphony, are much more likely to be seen as an upper class thing to do, historically associated with having like people going to see them having a lot of wealth. I'll take closing. Considering that opera is well funded by the high ticket prices that you currently talk about, why is this debate not about art which would otherwise disappear with the lack of funding? And it is certainly not about highbrow art well funded by million pound paintings. Right. Firstly, we think under our model we're not advocating complete cuts to these arts. We think there's still going to be funding available for these arts. We don't think it's the case that these arts are going to disappear. We think there's still going to be um, interest, particularly from like, people from upper class backgrounds, that, which might advocate these like, art subjects. We think that's much more likely. We think it's much more important at the end of the day to prioritise things like productive spending than to spend money preventing arts from disappearing. We think at the end of the day it's still much more important to prioritise things like infrastructure and education. Right? So we think that because of this, and because of how people like, scrutinise how they're tax money is being spent because we recognise that when you're borrowing, when you're taking lots of money off individuals, they're going to see how that money is being spent, right? We think that if there is a perception that money is being taken away from your benefit, like, and put towards an elitist area, right, we think um, that this creates resentment, especially if economically, if, especially if it's economically tough times. If people are living through, like, a recession, if people are struggling to cope with living costs, etc., they're not going to feel particularly good, right, and particularly happy with their government if their government is then going and spending money on things that are seen as for people's pleasure or don't, are not seen as having as much benefit as things like um, economic incentives and spending money on education. So we think this reduces public support for the arts, which we think is fundamental towards the arts areas in general. Like we think it's much better to take a substantial more amount of money to be spent on economic spending rather than creating a negative outlook um, on like arts and humanities subjects, which is much more likely under the other side of the house. So we think that a failure to divert spending is often damaging to art subjects as well. Ladies and gentlemen, we believe that it's fundamental and it is a fundamental duty of the state to be able to prioritise public spending in order to seek like, the economic benefits to individuals, especially in difficult economic times. And it's for these reasons that we, we are very proud to stand in proposition. Thank you very much. I gave a little bit of extra time because of the interruption. Um, I now call on the first speaker from St Andrews and St Brides Edgar to respond as the first opposition speaker. Seven minutes, please. Thank you, Chairperson. Now, let us be clear. What we on the opposition are arguing in favour of is not a reduction in the current spending and economic policies. What we are arguing in favour of is the status quo. We are not saying that we want increased funding for the humanitarian and arts, etc. Humanitarian, uh, humanitarian and arts, etc. What we want is to reject this motion that the economy-based policies should be pri prioritised. Now, a few points of rebuttal. You talk of improving people's life. Well, the proposition would have you believe that to improve someone's life it has to be with cold, hard money. We on the opposition would like to argue that you can actually gain some of this through uh, the arts and humanity, humanitarian prospects, but it's also about enrichment and a cultural growth within a society. And we disagree with the proposition's motion that funding should be taken from policies as the arts, etc., and instead placed in econ economy-based policies. Now, 
First, our first key point, ladies and gentlemen, is quite simply, money isn't everything. Now, I'm not saying we should go full-scale Bhutan, but I'm not, not sure if you're familiar with Bhutan's um, recent development where they've ditched gross domestic product as their main indicator of development, and it's now gross national happiness. We're not arguing anything like this extreme. But what we are saying is there is more to a happiness, there is more to a person than cold, hard cash. It's about the enrichment of a society, a cultural growth. And the minuscule increase that the average person, the average person here in Britain, would actually experience from these, it's not really very sufficient compared to the happiness, no thank you, that would be received from these humanity arts, and it is received, and we're saying it should be continued to be received, no thank you, we're saying it should be continued to be received and not put second, uh, second fiddle to econ economy-based uh, policies. And another point of rebuttal is that, just, I would like to clarify that, just not right now please, uh, just as uh, propositions say that they don't want to cut funding for humanity and arts, etc., we are also still, we're not saying that we're going to be cutting economic policies, but we're still going to have infrastructure projects, we're still going to have these growth, but we're also going to have more focus on these humanity aspects of it. Now, a key point, no thank you, a key point of the propositions debate was the, the elite sort of opera arts sort of area. Now, we would like to ask, we'd like you to ask yourselves, what arts would we not have if the proposition's motion had already been put in place? It's, it is these arts, it's the, opera, uh, the operas we'd still have, because the, elite, the elitist groups, those of the upper class with the money, would still be able to fund them themselves. But ironically, it's also them, I'll take you in a second, it's also them who would benefit from the economic growth. The, as I say, it would be a minuscule increase and if any, in the average Britain's purse or wallet, it would be those at the top of the engineering businesses, etc., that would actually receive the benefit of the econ economy policies that they would like to prioritise. I'll take you now, please. But if people are getting richer, the argument is, is that they can then afford the new products of art that even if they have to pay for, that will be minor, and, they're now, and they can now afford them because, because they're now spending more on economic product, uh, productivity. Well, I would um, disagree with the argument there. Because People, again, are people going to get richer? Who is it that's going to get richer? That's what we're saying. We're saying it's the people at the top who would actually benefit greatly from this, from this uh, prioritisation of economic policies. It's the people that own the companies. It's the people that actually make the big profit, not those who are on a £7 minimum, or minimum wage to go and build you know, the engineering projects, the shipbuilding. It's those at the top of the budget that make the big money that actually can afford it. And I would also like to say that... Um, one of our um, main arguments is also that arts, we've, so far we've centred on elitist and upper class arts like opera, etc. But the arts and humanity projects that government funds often help the lower class people. For example, London gangs, etc. Get them off the street. You know, you see graffiti artists. That's, if you look around Glasgow today and with the Commonwealth Games, there was a great project. On all, not all the walls you have the side of the buildings, or what would have once been considered graffiti art is now a cultural part of Glasgow. You've seen tourists taking pictures with it. You've seen it was a talking point, social media. Not right now, thank you. All over. This is the sort of projects that we want the government not to put to the side and to prioritise these economy-based um, policies, but we want to see a growth of this culture within just Scotland, within Glasgow. We want the other cities, you see, again, projects like even the... Uh, post box been painted gold after the Olympics. That was a very cultural thing that the government brought into place and it sort of it enriched our society. It helped us celebrate the success of Britain and no thank you and a great sporting event that we helped to hold. Now we think that government funding should be used efficiently. Not right now, thank you. I think we can all agree on that. But as I have shown, it is those at the top that would benefit from the economic gains of prioritising those policies. And so, really, government, we think they should be helping those who actually need the help. You know, if they do help 
graffiti artists, etc., get them off the street, off the crime. That's saving money within the police force. It's saving money within court cases, etc. That's just, you know that's a few maybe a bit trivial examples, but they are excellent examples of how we would be using money efficiently by actually helping those who need it. If we help those who, who are already at the top, who are already making money, they don't need as much help as those at the bottom. If we want to grow as a society, Final and that's not an, thank you. That's not an efficient spending of money within a country. And then. I would also, you, you see, if the proposition had their way, they would no longer have these musicians and artists, etc., coming from lower class, because there's no, no longer the sort of market incentive for it. The government providing money gives them the opportunity to embrace these arts, to, and it develops them as some people who might get caught up in crime, might be caught up in petty crimes especially, such as shoplifting, etc., are allowed to develop their own natural talents. It might not be. It helps those who are not the most academic in society. It helps those who have other extracurricular uh, curricular, so pardon me, talents, and it helps them to develop. And that, when you have those who are already, all, those who have academic abilities, already help to uh, grow the, co the country to grow both economically and as a society and a spiritual growth. But, Come to a close, please. Um, yeah. And this is why we in the proposition believe, because we are helping those who don't have such academic talents, but they have other talents, by uh, embracing those and actually allowing them to help our country gr grow spiritually and also economically. We believe that this uh, motion should be opposed. Thank you. Many thanks. Can I now call the second proposition, proposition speaker from Aberdeen, McCreath, to give their views? I believe that's David McCreath. Thank you. We don't contend, Madam Chairperson, that art often is valuable for individuals. Our contention on opening government today is that if you are a single mother struggling to feed your family, wondering about how you're going to get to the food bank and holding down two jobs, your ability to appreciate a play or a poem is probably significantly less than someone with greater resources. We think fundamentally... Fundamentally, government must, it's a necessary condition for governments to be able to improve people's livelihoods before they can often achieve this art. We think not only do you get better art on our side, but you get people that are better able to achieve it. Today I'm going to be looking at like, how arts funding actually works under the status quo, how we think it tends to be elite bodies of often white men that decide what kind of art they want, how we actually get better art if you care about art under our side. First of all, lots of points of rebuttal. Alex Dawn stands up and appoints information and says this isn't a debate about highbrow art. So we think, ladies and gentlemen, that a vast majority of the art that's currently found is things like Royal Opera, museums in central London and stuff like that. We're when saying we're quite happy for that funding to be cut under our side and actually give some money to people like in the north of England or in Scotland that are struggling and stuff like that. We think it very much is a debate about that sort of art, but we'll also talk about minority art in a bit. Secondly, we hear that money isn't everything. So here's the thing. First of all, it's true that art often contains some benefit. We think government is often a poor actor to understand what those benefits are because they are often subjective. What government should do is prioritise spending that it can say definitely will have a tangible effect. This is what Ailey brings you and isn't responded to. So at the point at which a government can go, this is the economic benefit from a certain policy, I have a tangible amount of money and that money will not be wasted on this by producing some weird form of modern art, like a, a, a blank canvas on a wall that no one understands, ladies and gentlemen. Like we think it's much more easier to get tangible benefits when you use like economic economic criteria as a basis. Second, and, and also, like, the, the introduction that I gave you as well, that often, like, some form of resources are a necessary condition for, uh, for, uh, bre uh, for appreciating art. Secondly, what we hear is that often art helps minority groups and, low, and like, people in economically deprived conditions. First of all, note that in that case, art is a reactive form of help for these people. It would probably be better if we didn't have gang violence to address in these communities in the first place, which you're probably more likely to get if you, like, 
give job opportunities and like better schooling to these communities. We think rather than just like helping them to like construct a poem about their troubles after that, right? We think that's probably a better mode to help this out. Uh, um, and then finally, ladies and gentlemen, we think that if it's government efficiency that they, they could they, 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 they are concerned about as the first speaker brings, then it is this cost-benefit analysis you should be making your decisions on, not subjective criteria on what is good art and what makes benefits to an individual. On to, no, on to the first point then. So we think OP can't just defend for you today some abstract arts funding in which only minority groups are helped. We think they have to defend what arts funding currently is under the status quo. So note a few things about how art funding works at the moment. Firstly, it's done by art bodies, for example, like the British Film Council or like Art Scotland, or I don't know what the actual name, Creative Scotland, I think it is actually is the name. Second of all, note that these bodies are not particularly transparent and don't have a, partic like a lot of accountability, right? A lot of their decisions are made behind closed doors with a certain kind of a criteria which is subscribed to arts uh, bodies and organisations. Finally, also note that they tend to be populated by quite wealthy people, like often, often from like the, do, like, the do, like the dominant white group, um, and, and that is the position, and that is the, the kind of overarching makeup of these bodies. What is the effect of this? First of all, because art is subjective, what these people will tend to do is fund art that they themselves view as, as like productive and good. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that you have as much of the funding of the kind of community art that they want to talk about, although we can see there is some. The majority of the art you fund are things like, like museums in central London, like, the symph like symphony orchestras and stuff like that. Often, people, often forms of art that people can't be related to. Second of all, as we've just said, they tend to be in geographically concentrated areas like central London, like Edinburgh and Scotland, and not in more remote areas when people are often like even worse off and find it harder um, to, to get that art. Finally, we think it's quite harmful because like um, finally a lot of these bodies are on inflated salaries. We think a lot of arts organisations have very wealthy patrons and go to expensive dinners so there probably is some slack in some room whereby these funding bodies could like divert funds, um, uh, divert funds else, elsewhere and have more arts funding. So ladies and gentlemen, what do we think happens um, under R. Here we go. So why do we think we get better funding under other R side? So we think the, what this motion will do, I'll take you in a minute, Alex. What this motion does is sends out a message to arts bodies that they can no longer reliably rely on governments for funding and they must assume a, lot more, a more popular basis and a more community engaged approach for their funding. Go. It really isn't about giving either all the money to arts or all the money to the poor. Can we get some analysis as to why this abstract infrastructure project will bring any meaningful benefits as opposed to the very tangible cultural benefits that derive from art in all forms of consumption? Here, here. Tangible cultural benefits on your side, absolutely not. One, often large infrastructure projects help wide geographical areas, like the HS2 project, for example, will help most of the west coast of England. Secondly, ladies and gentlemen, even if it doesn't help, help your specific geographic area, because they provide a return for government, that return can then be redistributed to other areas, right? If you're in a specific, like an art gallery built in one community, which you can't get access to because you live in the highlands of Scotland, provides no benefit for you and has no red redistributive goal. There's your comparative, Alex. So, at the point, of, so now they have to appeal to more popular forms of funding. What does this do? Firstly, we don't mind if art becomes more democratic and has to appeal more to popular opinion. Why? Because if they say that people get benefit from art and like help get self-realisation and identity from art, you probably want art that appeals to the majority of people so the majority of people can get this benefit from art. Why do you get this under this model? Because art bodies, in order to get funding from the majority of people, if they can't get that from government, will have to attract the majority of people through things like entrance fairs and stuff like that. Second of all, we think if minority minority art really is good for those communities, uh, you have much more of an incentive to get smaller, like, we, th we still think that can be supported when minority groups, like, really care about that art. We don't think we have a complete eradication of minority art. But finally, ladies and gentlemen, funding bodies now make more, or arts bodies and community bodies now make more of an effort to go into communities and ask what kind of art that they want. Ask what they want, what kind of art they want to achieve, because that way people are a lot more likely to attend that art, and it has a lot more popular appeal. So you don't just still get art, Art, you get better art that is genuinely more engaging in people. And I'm successful tickled. art is no longer determined by strict criteria set by funding bodies that, like, uh, that is some sort of high-class thing that is done by government. Ladies and gentlemen, ultimately, we get people with more resources that are better able to appreciate art and art that is better under our side. I'm very proud to propose.
Thank you very much. Can I now ask the second opposition speaker from St Andrews and St Bride's Edgar to speak? I think it's Chris Edgar. Thank you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at a couple of things. First of all, I'm going to look at the conception of what the good life is that we sort of get out of opening government and why it's better on our side of the House. And second of all, I'm going to look at specifically minority art, which is where this debate is today, and explain why we deal with that better on our side of the House. Their characterisation is completely wrong. I'll deal with that in turn. Let's first of all look at the, the, like the case that we get out of opening government. So, like, first of all, they tell us that like, you just can't appreciate any art if you're struggling a bit economically. We have a couple of responses. We think, first of all, it's not entirely clear why that's true. We think, like, look, like, uh, on our side of the house, we still provide a base level of social security. Okay? Yeah, we yeah. stop like, people falling into derelict poverty. Right? It's not clear why the, ha the, the happiness you get on government side of the house from being slightly less in poverty is, like, uh, is necessarily greater happiness than what we bring you through art. Okay? We think, if anything, it's like a, a, a reprieve from like, whatever terrible situation you might find yourself in to have the option on our side of the house to have that little bit of happiness in your life. We think that's probably beneficial on our side of the house. No. Like, second of all, look, we bring you a really good characterisation from the Leader of the Opposition when he tells you that this has community benefits in specific circumstances in terms of dealing with gang violence. There's, the response is just to say, well, no, we'd rather stop gang violence. Well, yes, we'd rather stop it too. It's not that easy, right? Gang violence will still continue to exist to some extent on your side of the house. So we need some sort of mechanism for dealing with it when it does occur. We provide a very good characterisation of how you might do that. Moreover, art in and of itself provides a prevention mechanism at the point at which you have people who've escaped from the gang culture, who can like, like, uh, you know, convey it in some sort of like, artistic context to convince people that this is not the route to go down. We think that's beneficial. We need a better response. Maybe Joe will do that. Like, second of all, they tell, us, look, like, they tell us that we have to defend art funding as it is under the status quo. And he gives us a lot of reasons why the current body that decides like, who gives art is really corrupt and rubbish. So we tell you, no, we chose to defend the level of arts funding as it is in status quo in proportion to the level aimed at economic growth. Like, we're quite happy to say we'll reform the institutions that decide where this art goes. If they really are as like, corrupt as you say, if they really are as white-centric as you say, we will do it better. We'll have a better characterisation. Finally, like, he tells us like, for like, a minute and a half towards the end of his speech that what he wants is better art, right? And his characterisation of better art is art that appeals to a majority of people, right? We don't think art is a democratic concept where the more people say this looks nice means that's better art. We don't think that's reasonable. We think art, like, art uh, you know, affects you specifically as an individual. We don't think it's legitimate just, that, just to say because in the UK most people are white that like, art that's aimed at white people is better than art that's aimed at Bangladeshis because there's hardly any Bangladeshis, so obviously that's not good art in the UK. We don't think that's reasonable. Recognise the types of people that we're talking about, the types of art, is the very art that does not have the alternative sources of funding. I'll come on more to this in a second, right? But recognise the, the alternative source of funding that they offer you as donations from random old rich people, right? I'm sorry, these are the white people that you're talking about, the old conservative white people that buy into the exact type of art that David says he doesn't want on his side of the house. Let's move on to some substantive material. So first of all, like, let's look at the conception of what a good life is, what a better society is, and why it's better on our side of the house. Okay? We think ultimately proper concerns purely with monetary outcomes, and they think that if they can, like, uh, it's purely calculated and cold, and if they get a, a few extra numbers, then necessarily, necessarily your life is better. It's not clear why this is the only metric. The only reason they give us that this is better is because you can calculate it. Like, the only reason they don't seem to value art is because it's quite hard to work out how good it is. We don't think that's good enough. We think it's probably important that people do have some form of happiness in their life that doesn't come purely through economic growth. We think that's probably a harmful conception to try and peddle. Okay? We think ultimately we have a more holistic, rounded view of what is a good society. Okay? We enrich people's lives in a way that like, a little bit of ex extra economic growth on their side of the house just doesn't do it on comparative. On our side, we have like, an extensive, for example, free museums that he, that, that, that he knocks to say this is an example of the majoritarianism that's prevalent in art. We think, no, that's probably a good thing even on itself. We're happy to take that burden and defend all the free 
museums that you have in London. We think that's a really good thing. Okay, we think att uh, uh, we would oppose attempts to significantly curtail this by reducing funding or introducing entrance fees. We think that would be a, a very bad idea that they necessarily would presumably have to defend on their side of the house. Okay, like recognise that they have some sort of educational value at the point at which you can see and in some instances like touch these objects and derive some sort of like educational um, you know, cultural appreciation that you couldn't get through strict textbooks. It also creates some sort of sense of national pride and national identity. Recognise London's position as a cultural home of like Europe, for example, is like really important in terms of the sort of fr pride that we feel about ourselves in a country. Recognise also that this, at least to an extent, mitigates some of the economic harms that are necessary as a result of, as a result of our preference, um, given that you know, we, we bring in like tourism and stuff as a result of this. Okay, moving on to the really important part of our case, okay? the effect that this has on minority art. We have two aspects of this. Okay? We think, first of all, public funding allows minority artists to shape their own identity and to have art that wouldn't have existed otherwise. Okay? We think like, this like, has a pr pr promotional aspect, okay? given that you know, you, this facilitates a pride in your own culture, as opposed to a state where elite art is still available because there's a market for it, but no other art exists. Okay? And it's a conception that this is the only sort of art that is legitimate for you to enjoy. Why is this true? Because look, like, it costs X amount to produce a play, no matter who the target audience is. The difference is, okay, under their side of the house, elites can still continue to pay for it because they can afford higher entrance fees, and, the, and majoritarian art can still afford uh, because they can have lots of people. Okay? Like minorities don't have either of these. They don't have the rich elites, and they don't have the pure numbers. We still think they deserve some cultural heritage too. They deserve the ability to express art forms as well. Um, ultimately, like the, the absence of art for you that you get as a, di a, as a necessary result of their policy. Um, I'll take closing if you want. No, David, on you go. to have more widespread benefits to society through infrastructure projects which have a tangible return to everyone in that society. Uh, Final no, minute. because look, the, the return you're getting to everybody is so infinitesimally small that it's not making as significant as a difference to like, particularly uh, 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 dangerous, uh, uh, like, you know, vulnerable groups on our side of the house. We provide a massive benefit to a specific group of people. We think that's far more tangible than anything you claim to bring on your side of the house. Okay? We think ultimately this is a more substantial harm and we solve for it. <laughs> Crucially, we think this also provides uh, like minority groups an ability to control their own message in a society where mainstream artists um, are, are consistently um, are effectively appropriating minority culture through their own forms of art. Okay? We think ultimately it's beneficial to have a counter-narrative to this at the point at which you can like, present an, an, integ an integrity-filled, accurate conception of what your own art is. We think that's far better on our side of the house. So look, this is what you've got to weigh up. The difference is, under their side of the house, all they have is the elite art, the snobbish art, the majoritarian art. And art like, if you recognise that art has Come some sort of close, value, please. we don't think we should deny that to minority cultures who are most vulnerable, who most need this, who most need the expression of their identity, purely on the grounds that there aren't very many of them and we prefer to trickle out some uh, economic resources that are presumably almost as hard to measure on their side of the House. Oppose the motion. Thank you, and thank you to both our teams. Can I now ask the first speaker from Hindland Dyer to open the case for the closing proposition team, please? Okay, so there's three questions on this debate. Firstly, comparatively, which per pound of spending impacts me as an individual more? Economic productivity or a painting or a play? Secondly, under which system does the economic spending that you are doing reach more people and reach vulnerable people? And thirdly, if I have time, although it's slightly less important, um, does art get better? Uh, before I uh, deal with those three things, firstly, some rebuttal. So Chris, at the end of his speech there, he tries to tell us that what's really good about, um, about spending on art is that it leads to tourism and that leads to economic productivity. No, 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 he doesn't get those types of art because that type of art would be economic product, like economically productive art. We get those types of art and he isn't allowed to claim them for his side of the house, right? Because that would be economic, uh, economically productive and that's the prop. Secondly, he says that it's really bad because minorities are screwed over because they necessarily, you know, um, like, uh, like they can't access art in the same way. The problem here is that minorities don't, probably don't have much of an input over art as it is currently funded under the status quo because they make up a minority of that state-funded art councils, right? It's very unclear why individuals who are the state funding that art would necessarily care about those kinds of minorities. But secondly, that's non-comparative. 
Also, minorities don't have the same amount of Sorry, economic life choices as white people do. So insofar as minorities are disadvantaged under each side of the house, the question of this debate then becomes under which, uh, uh, under which method do we best help them? So first of them, benefits of economic spending versus the benefits of arts to the individual. So we were told that ultimately, uh, you know, that proposition have, stand, uh, have stood up here and said that money solves everything. No, it doesn't. But money is extraordinarily important to the way that you live your life. So the comparative that we're having here is the increased prospect that I have a job versus a plethora of free plays, free art, free museums, and whatever. Under which is going to give me more individual benefits? Here are four benefits of just having more money and having higher uh, economic productivity. The first thing to say is that money often gives you the ability to spend on things that you enjoy, which you derive a huge amount of happiness for. Opposition have just stood up and say, yes, there are other really important things. No, no, no. The ability for me to go out and to do the things that I enjoy is hugely important, and you are necessarily taking that away because you are spending it on art. Like, it's not consumerist to say that. It's not just like having stuff in the vacuous sense. It's having the amount of money to go out and live your life in the way that you choose. But secondly, having money opens up choices to you, right? It opens up the ability to do things that these guys are so caring about, uh, such as expanding your life choices. It's far more difficult for me to do other non-consumerist things that aren't related to money if I have to take the day off work. I need to have money in order to do those kinds of life-enriching things that these guys are talking about. Otherwise, I'm going to be too poor to do it because I'm never going to have that time of work. Thirdly, we suggest that it often gives you a great amount of purpose to your life. The idea of knowing that you have earned that money yourself, you have gone out and you have worked hard because the government has actually spent on, that, spent on you effectively, the impact that I get from that compared to the impact that I get from seeing a painting or seeing a good play is tr obviously tremendously more important because I feel much more enriched within myself and I feel as though I've done a good job. But fourthly, it provides you with the ability to care for those who are close to you and who you love. I can't spread the benefit of seeing a play or a painting to my children or to my family, but I can insofar as my government spends that money that it would have done on providing me with a job, no thanks. That's far much more tangible. That's going to give those individuals in my life far much more impact insofar as my state cares for them. So let's, so let's then look at the comparative, right? Because I'm going to take them on at their highest. I'm going to assume, right, there's going to be tons of art under their world. Even at their highest, the problem is that often your enjoyment of that art is contingent on that money. Why is that? Because even if it opens up your life to like a whole new perspective, presumably in order to enact th those changes to your life, you're going to need money to do that. It changes your very conception of what the world is, but if I have no money to enact those changes that I want to do, then how am I going to actually create those changes? If a, if a painting or a play inspires me to change who I am, I often need money to enact those kinds of changes that I want to make in my life. But secondly, even just the benefit that you get, get from art in itself is very short term. Why? Because it is a distraction from the real life that you have when you go home and you realise that you are underpaid and that you don't have a job and that your school children don't have as good enough school uniforms as the school children uh, in the same neighbourhood as you. So even if you get some kind of utility and pleasure from that, that is obviously going to be very short term, right? That's going to be at best a distraction from the problems that you have in your life. So that's why money uh, and economic productivity is relatively important compared to art. But secondly, and probably most importantly, why is it that our kind of spending affects more people than art. The first thing to realise, so they say, oh no, no, it's, I mean, like, we're still going to have the arts budget. I, okay, so we're still going to have the welfare budget. No, no, let's be clear. The arts budget is huge, right? Like, we spend more on arts than we do on foreign aid. Like, it is a huge amount of money. It is illegitimate for them to stand up and say, oh yes, well, we'd still have lots of welfare. No, no, the contention is we would obviously have much more spending on welfare, right? In order for this debate to function, you have to realise that there is a comparative that exists. But why is it then that economic spending trickles to more people than art does? For two reasons. Firstly, the, like, the multiplier effect. Every pound that the government spends on economic uh, spending, such as roads or jobs, the pound that I get for my wage, I then go and spend in a shop. That shopkeeper then spends... Everyone all along the way is being taxed. That then means that the implications, no thanks, per pound of economic spending is far more reaching than the impact of seeing a painting or seeing a play stay standing. That then means that governments have duties to, to, to help the maximum number of individuals and you're formally to do that with economic spending. Yeah. 
that's economically illiterate in that the multiplier effect still happens if that money is going into the artistic sector in the same way if it was going into infrastructure. That money is not seized by greedy arts who then bury it in fields. They do the exact same purchasing pattern that employees of roads or employees of infrastructure projects would as well. The money is um, reinvested. Are you in your final minute? Uh, no, um, because when you... Like, because when you spend money on art, you aren't paying someone a wage to do a job who then can also go out and spend. It's not the case that like, you necessarily... Like, you don't get the same multiplier effect than if you just gave someone a new job, because now those people have extra money to spend into the economy. But more importantly, how does it affect the vulnerable? Because this is really important, and the poor. There is always an incentive to help out the poor, to help out women, and to help out ethnic minorities if, you're, if, if, if your goal is to be economically productive. Why? Because it's not economically productive to have them out of work. Your economy will grow if you have more women, more poor people on, on welfare, into work. That necessarily means that there's always the economic incentive to have these people out into work. That's why it reaches more people. That's why it reaches far more people than the minority art that they, that, they, that they tell us about. Why? Because these people don't visit art galleries. They're too concerned about what they have to put in front of their plates for their families, insofar as we provide something that is far more reaching, that affects vulnerable people far more, and there's a far bigger multiplier effect, despite the fact that Alex called me uh, economically literate, and the individual impacts, love you too, of the actual benefits compared to the individual benefits of just seeing a play is far bigger, so for the reasons we propose. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. I would now like to call the first speaker from Linlithgow Dawn to open the case for the closing opposition team, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Presiding Officer. Ladies and gentlemen, proposition, noble judges. Before I start, I think we should all reflect that we should be proud to be living in a country, Scotland, the UK, where our national heroes and treasures are the artists, are the writers, are the playwrights, are the uh, drawers and illustrators, rather than military generals and politicians and millionaire chief executives. We have a proud history of arts and entertainment in this country, and we should be proud of that collectively. Or I start on my substantial case, I'd like to make a few points of rebuttal. The proposition said people get richer the government spending on economics, and therefore buy and fund more art. But measuring the economic distribution that comes from this policy is very uncertain. Even if certain people, uh, wealthy people, uh, from these policies, it is unclear whether they'll actually spend it on One art. Minute. What is guaranteed outcome of side proposition is making art cheaper than hypothetically making certain individuals richer. Here, here. This makes art more accessible to those who may not want it to be, uh, uh, to those who may not always get art. So I proposition also say we want to save people who are on the brink of extreme poverty. We agree this is a noble aim to save people who are on the brink of extreme poverty. But we don't think this is a debate about giving all our money to the poor or all our money to the art. This is a debate about funding that currently exists. That funding is not enough to fund a £50 billion HS2 high-speed line, which is probably going to be over budget and behind schedule, a bit like the Scottish Parliament building. <laughs> so I proposition also say that any art that turns a profit can be claimed by government cause as good. No, thank you. I'm only a school debater, but it doesn't seem fair to claim that art that makes any profit as proposition benefit our burden isn't just to defend art that loses lots of cash. Finally, in opposition, we say this. Bring your children to the play. Bring your children to the art gallery. Let everyone experience and enjoy art for what it truly is. Now, let me get on to my substantive case. No, thank you. What outcomes should the state pursue? Not just finance. Not just economic growth. It's not just about money, money, money all the time. It's not just about power either. We admit it not, should not be exclusively about highbrow elite art, such as the opera, or about million-pound paintings in Sotheby's in London. We are reasonable and pragmatic. We agree it should be about art in communities. Our main interest is about providing the most efficient balance between policy and spending. This aims to create an equal, just, cultural and industrious nation. We call this outcome cultural capital. And a detailed analysis of outcome in this policy 
is what will bring you an extension. No, thank you. The, why art? Why is art in particular especially vulnerable? Because the uh, government support is art is crucial if we want art to prosper and survive. The market economy we live in is not perfect and is particularly cruel to artists. Why is it difficult for these people? There's a narrow market. There's not much room to grow. You're relying on popularity and on the fashions of the day. Ability is not, a perfect, uh, is not perfect of securing success. You may have to wait to achieve this. While you're waiting to achieve success, you need support to grow. The Arts Council funding, for instance, or scholarships to art schools, bursary for projects and community funds are all good ways to support the arts. No, thank you. These are needed for insensitive to go, for people to go into the arts. The arts is seen as a very unpopular uh, sector of the economy at, at the moment because it's seen as very difficult to break into. But with government support, we can get artists and writers into their professions and start making money. All these art artists are working very efficiently for very little money at creating beautiful projects, uh, pro products rather, uh, paintings, plays, things that inspire everyone. No, thank you. This is important because it's comparatively cheap, com much cheaper than HS2, for instance, has incredible cultural value, and most importantly, this is crucial. It would die without public support, without government intervention and spending. There is no market alternative to maintain these arts and to maintain this critical mass across a nation. Now, what I want to focus on now is art and support in communities that the government is talking about so much. We agree that there are areas of institutional poverty, no thank you, in the UK. For example, Manchester, Newcastle, Glasgow even. There is a need there for drama classes and support for the arts. Community centres, unfortunately, do not have the capital to maintain artistic projects. Without government support, they lose a very cost-efficient thing that adds value to their lives. If you get engaged with arts, no thank you, you get a better standard of living, a better quality of life, a more enjoyable life, and it adds to the human experience. Also, no thank you. The new... They now never get an opportunity to participate or thrive in this crucial uh, thing, no thank you, in art, if they do not get the money from government. Final uh, minute. Thank you, presiding officer. Because of all the vulnerabilities in this micro-economy, uh, artists are not rich, uh, they need support. It is a micro-economy, and I'm now going to describe to you when this goes wrong. Let's look at America, for instance. There's no national funding for arts. It's uh, state-based across the 50 states. What we can see here, therefore, is extreme economic disparities in the artistic availability in America's poorest communities. For example, in New York State, it provides funding for artistic opportunities in poorest urban communities, such as writing workshops, drama projects, and funding for extracurricular activities in schools. As a consequence, uh, FASA, which is a drama school artistic college, taken a much larger group of students from deprived backgrounds. Compared to that, say, Missouri, that state, they do not provide that funding, and children in de deprived areas don't get the same access to art. To a cycle please. of cultural deficit uh, in, uh, happens, therefore, and I hope uh, to sum up, uh, I hope you understand the contribution art can make to the economy and how government spending is crucial to maintain the arts. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you stay with side opposition. Thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to call on the second speaker from Highland Dyer to conclude the case for the proposition. I work out that must be Martin Monahan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'll start with the question, but first, a couple of facts. One million people in Scotland live in poverty. That's one in every five people. Now, I'll ask you this. How many of those are reaping the benefits of funding paintings? 
How many of those have had their lives improved by painting post boxes gold? Our argument is based on basic utilitarianism. That is the belief that policies should be made based on the happiness of the majority of people. I will bring up a point that has not been largely discussed so far. Take any one type of art and the majority of people in the country will not really be interested in it. Why should we be funding this? If people have more money because of investing in the economy, then they can afford to choose to spend money on this art that they make a personal judgment on. One minute. Which brings me to my next point. Forcing people to pay to see art is a way of regulating it and making sure that it is art which people actually enjoy. There's, there's the way you get your happiness benefit from art. Yes. Like, even if you give people a bit more money, the problem is people from minority cultures can't afford uh, to, to, to like fund their own art because there isn't enough cross cross subsidisation from other people. Right? Like, they, you're denying specific groups of people access to art that brings them direct happiness. No, we're not denying them. No, we're not actually. What we're proposing is that we invest money in these minorities so that they have so that money is generated in their local economy and they have money to spend. Art or spend on art as they choose. Now, the state has a basic responsibility to look after the welfare of its citizens. Art does not come under that back bracket. Um, yes. Uh, under that bracket, you could include art because that does look after the welfare of the citizens. It improves the life of the citizens and it improves their standard of living. Well, no, that's completely subjective. It's as as we've discussed already. Art's a subjective concept. It doesn't vastly improve the welfare of the country as a whole of a population. Um, I'll talk about the multiplier effect now. If you give a fiver to a rich person, i.e. the way that is being discussed in this debate through subsidising art, so as that old elitist people don't have to subsidise it, that has hardly any economic impact. However, if you give a fiver to someone on minimum wage, someone struggling to feed themselves, they will go out into their local economy and spend that money. That is spent in their shops. The shop spends it on more food, and that is being taxed at every step along the way. This generates revenue so that, that you can, that, sorry, you can um, invest more in these economies and you have uh, a great cycle um, sorry, generating money for the economy. Um, over time, this greatly strengthens the economy of the country. And you may not have to make the choice between art and investing in the economy later on down the line. That's what's known as the multiplier effect. Now, why does economic spending go to the vulnerable more than art? Being economically productive means you always have an incentive um, to get poor women and ethnic minorities into work, because that is what leads to higher GDP. Compare it with art. The vulnerable don't care about anything other than having money. Well, I say that in a basic term. Of course, they need to feed themselves and everything, but the bottom line is they need money to do so. Lastly, there's no real way to measure the benefits of art. If you invest in your economy, you've got figures to back that up. You can prove why it's important or why a certain policy is doing well. Yes? How happy do you realistically think you're going to be if you're living in a country where the only form of art is, like, uh, is aimed towards like, people who aren't you and you have no expression of your own art? Do you not think you derive some sort of happiness from that? Well, yeah, of course you do, but we're not going to cut spending altogether and art's not going to die because we're, stopping, because we're cutting the investment of it. As we've said already, investing in the local economies means that... Um, People can spend on art as they choose to. As we've said, a majority of people will not support any one type of given art. So, um, giving them or allowing them more money to spend on their art will mean it's supported more by grassroots ways and not top down government based on what some people decide that's good art. Um, as I said, there's no way to measure the benefits of art. I mean, how do you scale the happiness that's created by, you know? subsidising paintings, subsidising plays, 
You know, you can't, you can't put it on the table, you can't get figures from it, whereas economically you can, you can see what's beneficial and what's not. The impact of having more money is you can spend it on what you want to, as we've already outlined. If the art is that good that it's, it's bringing happiness to ethnic minorities and, and, um, and people that it really means something to, then that means they can spend it on that. And as we said, the grassroots keeps the art going. Important art will be kept alive by that. It's people's choices what they want to spend on art. It comes basically to, you know, do, does the average person want to be subsidising a play? No, they probably don't. And, yes, sorry. Um, you say there's Final no viable minute. way to measure the impact of art, but would you not agree that those who are taken off the street because of these street art projects, the productivity they bring to the country, and those who are, are no longer hindering our prison systems because they're not getting involved in gang violence, are benefiting from these government art projects, do you not think the productivity increase in the country is a viable way to measure the impact of art? Well, art doesn't stop gang violence. You don't like fund art and then suddenly you've got like no people killing each other anymore. It doesn't work like that. Um, lastly, the money it gives people a sense of purpose, and that is fundamental to their happiness. If people have a sense of purpose of going out to work, having an incentive to do so, that and then reaping the benefits of that, being lifting themselves out of poverty, that is surely more beneficial to their happiness than simply giving them something to look at in a museum. So, for the reasons of the... Draw to close, please. Um, people having more money to spend in their economy, um, the art being based on who wants to see it, um, we believe that you should support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. And that brings us to our final speaker, who I have worked out is Alex Dawn from Linlithgow Dawn, to conclude the case for the opposition, please. It's an absolute pleasure to be speaking here this evening, um, on St Andrew's Day nonetheless, uh, representing the eponymous institution whose relics were so heartlessly stolen by the churches you listed from our once grand cathedral. And it's been a pleasure to speak with Peter. And I think a lot of what Peter said has been, to be honest, uh, ignored. Uh, and I think a lot of what we brought in opposition still stands. In today's speech, I'm going to be looking at the extension we've heard and meaningfully engage with the most complex parts of their contribution, look at the comparative the opening government draws and show why the vulnerability and fragility of the arts sector is so fundamental to any discussion and about the impact art has not just on minorities but generally and why its occupation by a moneyed elite is not the status quo but the outcome that would follow this policy. So... Joe brings us a two-part development on exactly what happens here. He gives us a kind of hegemonia comparative, the idea of a good life or a good sense of happiness that can perhaps derive from art or perhaps derive from capital, and asks us to compare them. And he talks about economic multipliers. So I thought it was telling on the first One that minute. Joe's substantial point of analysis is that upon returning from art, you are forced to return to the reality that you're poor and you're having a difficult time. And this, we think in proposition, is unpleasant. Well... We, to be honest, think it is probably less pleasant than realising that there are moments of brilliance and beauty and excitement, and then having that as highs rather than one consistent appreciation of the lows. The most nuanced interpretation of Joe's point is that we would always want people to be kind of consistently average rather than have experience of something that might be better than the status quo, because the status quo then becomes intolerable. We don't think this is how psychology works. We don't think that after going for a great night out, I then have the blues for three days because nothing could quite compare to those dance moves at 2 a.m. I just reflect that that was a pleasant experience, that life is difficult, that work is hard, and get on with it. The idea that the poor, as have been characterised by the proposition, are just perpetually miserable, hate their lives, hate themselves, but do nothing to change because they just don't have sufficient agency or intelligence is clearly misrepresentative. And we don't think that to claim that you then isolate those benefits to the father, for example, or the mother, is accurate. You can bring your children along, you can get them engaged. The availability of community projects, community art, means they are more likely in their school, for example, to have someone funded by the local council providing a drama class than would otherwise be the case. In terms of the hegemonia, we don't buy it. 
Now, the economic multiplier frustrated me a little. Um, I think it is very strange to claim that capital invested in projects and contractors is distinct from capital invested in artistics. Uh, we think that it is obviously true that people spend money in similar ways, that money is very rarely removed from the economy, it's perpetually in circulation. Um, at its most nuanced, I think we could maybe say that these contractors might be paid more than would be available to us generally, or perhaps those contractors have specific benefits to the wider community. We think, for one, these contractors are usually, unlike how government framed it, private people licensed by the government. That does not mean that they are private sector. They are contractors licensed from the government, and so generally aren't from these most deprived areas you're talking about. So the money that you pay them to build whatever particular outcome you're looking for is then usually taken in terms of salary and investment out of the area that you're hoping to improve. More importantly, we think on the comparative, investing in the institution of domestic arts, which then stays within that community and provides a counter-narrative to some of the frustrating elements at the very bottom of society, as has been articulated, is a much better outcome. We don't think the extension was particularly persuasive. I'll give Joe a chance to respond. Yeah, um, my point wasn't that art makes you miserable, Alex. My point was that on the comparative, it is far more beneficial to go home to a more productive, more fruitful world in which you have more money. Yes, if no, you take we agree. Billions out we of the agree that utopia is probably better than poverty. We've not contested that. We just don't see how government have articulated a meaningful solution to the most fundamental problems that they constantly dump on opposition. We appreciate this debate is nuanced, and we think it's a fantastic debate. But it is not our job to say that we would rather have a play than people not. Being being poor. We just think that the money available to arts is not sufficient if removed entirely to fix all the issues you're hoping to address and specifically would then, if taken, never regenerate a domestic arts industry for all the reasons I'm going to go on to in just a second. Why? Because of the analysis we heard in the extension about why arts is uniquely vulnerable. Why is this? For one, it is not a meritocracy in the most absolute sense. Upon reaching a certain level of technical skill, your ability to succeed is conditioned on fashion, on luck, on people ultimately thinking that your paintings are in vogue, people thinking your plays are popular. You don't have the same ability to secure success as you do in other industries than you do in art. What is the implication of this? It means that it is very difficult to sustain yourself consistently as an artist. If you have any friends who are artists, if you have any friends who are studying in art schools, they will hear nothing but the frustrations of economic difficulty. They rely on the government to nurture these people in the formative stages of their career because if that funding was not available, they would not be able to subsist as artists. What does this mean? It means that the critical mass of creative figures within the local and broader national community begins to diminish over time. So even if we do get this funding as articulated, um, which they hope, to, uh, they, they hope to come from the wealthy, you never get the same groundswell of support for the arts among these most vulnerable communities. And the specifically perverse impact of the government case is that there is still a demand for art, right? But that demand, under their model, is predominantly localized to the moneyed to the people who have the capital to amuse their interests, which means that probably opera tickets go up a little, ballet becomes a little more expensive, but the Royal College will maintain its traditions. The most elite forms of entertainment will be provided for because there is a market and people have the capital to pay for it. What there is not is an alternative to the funding that is currently used to maintain an availability of art for all classes. Most importantly, and perniciously, the only people who are then capable of indulging in arts as a degree or indulging in arts as an option are people with independent finance, people with rich parents, people who can do an art degree on their gap yard and then sit in their studio, darling, in the attic of their family <laughs> and churn out mediocre tat because they have Final the capital minute. to do so indulgently. What happens in government is the funding that allowed the same artistic spirits in the very poorest sections of society to indulge those same excesses disappears. And they are forced by the same pressure to try and get a job, to try and succeed. They can't tell their family, they can't tell their parents that I want to be an artist because the only funding that might have justified that as an option or the only artistic presence that might have established it as a norm has disappeared. Which means that you don't just get the stuff that opening talked about to some extent kind of, about how there might be more ballet and less um, available art, but we do get a lot of wealthy people dominating their own sphere, which increasingly segregates from the broader community. We also then see that as a permanent effect with all the analysis that was unresponded to from my partner about why we look at America, where there is this kind of case study of distinct fundings offering distinct results. You get a perpetual deficit of culture in incredibly vulnerable areas, which means that nothing can be done to fix it from the ground up without infinitely more money than it would have been to just maintain that momentum. Building something is a lot more more expensive than maintaining something. It is for all these reasons Come and for Peter's conclusion. excellent
recent speech that we are very proud to stand in opposition in favour of maintaining art as a valuable entity that should be available to all and not letting it slip into the classist relegation of an oligarchy who would continue to have their own dull art perpetuated ad infinitum. I beg you to oppose. So, thank you very much. Can I thank all of our eight speakers for their contributions to the debate? I can apologise again to Ailey in the opening for getting the time slightly wrong. I did do that once to a government minister, so you're in good company, and I think you dealt with it better, perhaps. Can I now ask the judges, uh, the government minister to remain nameless, can I now ask our judges to leave to deliberate on what I do know will be a difficult decision. I was a judge a few years ago, so I know how difficult it is. Please return in 20 minutes. OK, so we'll now move on to the floor debate. Um, this is going to last for the 20 minutes um, and I'm going to invite speakers from the floor to raise points in relation to the debate and also in relation to the points that you've heard. If you want to speak, then please raise your hand. If you want to speak, please raise your hand. If selected, if you could wait for the red light to come on, either in front of you or somewhere near you, if you're sharing desks. Um, and if you could tell the Chamber your name and the name of your school or university before you raise your point. That's very important because I need to identify a winner, so I need to know who you are. If there's time, I might ask our teams to respond or contribute to points from the floor debate, but I think um, there may not be time for that. So remember, there's a prize for the best floor speech of the evening, and I'm now going to open the debate to the floor. So, we'll go first of all to the young man just right in front of me here, three rows back. Yep, if you could tell us your name and give us your point, please. Uh, my name is Jack Bogue. I'm from St Leonard's. Uh, um, so, like, the idea that we have is um, when you have the, the money taken from the, uh, from the arts, and what that does to the um, creative sectors, what that, what that can do, it, I think it could it could dis virtually destroy the whole, what I could say is our perception of art, because our perception of it is the idea of um, going down place, maybe places like East, East London, like kind of cult, sort of cultured pe people. And I so said, what, what it does is it, it takes art, if you know what I mean, it takes it off the street, it takes it off the street, off the... Um, off the general, well, well, I don't want to say the lower escalons of society, but um, saying it, it would take it up and it will make it more of a highbrow idea. And I think this could be incredibly worrying for society. As, as I think, I can't remember what speaker said this, but Scotland is a um, country which is proud to have its, um, some of its heroes as artists and writers. People, have, people who had things to say and express themselves rather than just people who sat on boards with big fat salaries. <laughs> uh, I think um, and these are the sort and the people that I was um, relating to latterly, they're the sort of people that um, I am um, to say are at fault for the banking crisis in t 2008, but that's an irrelevant matter. So, but, um, so what you have, I don't, I don't see how taking that money into infrastructure, I mean, it only has a marginal benefit compared to the absolute devastation that it would cause in the um, uh, creative sectors. That, uh, so I just simply think it's not worth it. Many thanks. And I'll go up to the right at the back, please, if you could tell us your name and your skill. Uh, Sam Thompson and it's Dumfries Academy. Um, I don't. Th I think there are three main things that most people in Scotland are concerned about, and I don't think it's going to be art. 
I think the three main things that people in Scotland are going to be concerned about are education, the health system, and people uh, and, and those that aren't able to actually feed their families and those who are maybe out of employment. I think the thing is, most people ha aren't saying, oh, have you seen the art gallery? It's not in a very good condition. It's not got the latest pieces of arts in it. People are concerned that they're not able to feed their family. People are concerned that even though they have jobs, they've still got to go to a food bank. So should this money not go back in where we can use this money to help people, to help people and bring them out of poverty? It shouldn't go to the arts because it will only have a small effect. People don't have People don't have a large affection towards... People who are sort of in the lower rung of society aren't going to be bothered that they can take their children along to a free, you know, play. They're going to be concerned that, one, they're not getting fed, and, two, maybe they don't get any Christmas presents. And that other families possibly judge them because they are working and still go to a food bank. People shouldn't have to do that. If you're in employment, you should be able to afford to, to afford to run your family. You shouldn't have to go to a food bank. And we shouldn't be saying, oh, the, the health system needs far more money and education it doesn't have enough funding. The funding should be in place. It shouldn't be going to arts. It should be going to redevelop in Scotland so that we can become a better country. Thank you, Sam. Um, at the back on my left-hand side, please. Um, hi, Greg Ramos, Woodmill High School. Um, this um, question is more aimed at the um, opposition. And you frequently claim that um, money is a um, less important factor. Sorry, not less important. It's a factor as um, it's not a main factor. It's just as important as other factors you've mentioned and such as happiness. But wouldn't you um, agree that in today's society, the money is a much more important factor than, um, say, happiness? I mean, money is just, you need it to survive in today's society. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we'll go to young women at the back here, straight in front of me, yes. Thank you. Um, hey, I'm Ranjana from James Gillespie's, and let me first talk about, you said that we have to make Scotland a better country. Do you think cutting down fundings for art will make Scotland a better country when the diversity that we get from art is what makes us really rich? The diversity we get from art and, and how everyone is truly represented and how everyone can express their freedom, like, and the right of expression, like the freedom of expression, is what we get through art. So if we cut down on art and spending on art, don't you think it's kind of cutting down on the freedom of expression and how everyone can express themselves and truly feel joy? Thank you. Thank you. Um, to the back here. Yes, right at the back, please. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Oliver Bond from Mar College. Um, I don't think people quite understand how much Scotland... This is more for against the proposition. Because people don't quite understand how much money we actually get from art. Art is all around us. Without art, we wouldn't have cartoons, we wouldn't have clothes. Design would be non-existent. And this building we are sitting in right now would not exist. We get money from the tax that the government puts on it. We get money from tourism. Even things like the aerospace tax, which people they pay which they tax people coming out, leaving the country. Without art, we'd be losing billions every year. Even things like the Kelpies, just recently built, but already a major tourist hotspot. Where would we actually be without art? Society would not have developed into the great wonder it is today. We would not have the pyramids. We wouldn't have the um, art galleries in central Glasgow. What has the proposition got to say to that? <laughs> Thank 
thank you, but I'm afraid we didn't quite catch your name. Could you just tell us again your name? Sorry. Oliver Bond. Oh, thank you. Um, OK, so right at the back here, please. Do I speak into it? OK. Um, Duncan Crow, I'm here with Glasgow University Union. I'm sorry, you have to say that again. Uh, Everybody was speaking Duncan really. Crow? Thank you. Uh, so, this is an idea a bit out of left field, but given art is quite a complex idea when we're debating about it, it might be sensible to think of this in terms of another metaphor. So, let's think about art as a means of communication, particularly communi political communication. And imagine for a moment, if we live in a world in which people don't have tongues at birth. So, you are allocated to tongues by some means of either private or public funding. Let's then run through the debate again in this world. So first propositions say, well, don't worry. We have private people sometimes funding tongues. You know, some rich people die, some white people will die, and they will decide to allocate tongues to certain people. And then I'll obviously point out, they might not necessarily allocate tongues to everyone, and particularly to some of the most vulnerable people. And then second propositions say, well, you know what? I mean, some people, poor people, might value having a pound in their pocket more than having a tongue. This might well be true, but if it is true, it's really, really sad, right? At the point where art is still part of the system by which we build our sense of identity, we engage in a kind of civic communication project, if we have entire groups of people that are cut out of that means of communication by virtue of the fact that they don't have people from those communities representing them by creating art that expresses how they see themselves and how they see their identity, not only do we you know, have people alienated that conversation, because as Alex points out, you know, some people feel the conversation no longer represents them, but it also means that we just get a lower quality of communication. We get less ideas in the discourse, we get less perspectives on how to see the world. So in other words, if you think it would be a bad idea to just leave the private sector to randomly allocate tongues to people, you probably also think it's a bad idea to leave the private sector to randomly allocate what people should be able to use art as a means of political communication. Cheers. Thank you. And Frontier, please, yes. From Highland Secondary, and I just like to say, as great as art is, I would much rather be able to like have a job. Like I can't go down to the art galleries and eat that Salvador Dali. I'm pretty <laughs> sure I would get into a lot of trouble for that. I can't, like, I can't send my little sister down to the library and be like, yeah, you can go eat that book. That'd be great. Like, I would like, much rather have the money spent on something that would like boost the economy. And I'd much rather, you know, be able to like self-sustain and have food than go and see the Lion King. Thank you very much. Um, young woman at the back here, please. Yep, yourself. Me, sorry. Yeah. Me. Okay, you go first, and then oh, I'll go sorry. to. Um, I just like to bring up a quick point. I'm oh, sorry. I need your name and your. Skin. Um, sorry, Elizabeth Groom um, from Mayans Castle. Um, just a quick um, point to the proposition um, about, like, the Glasgow School of Art Museum that, like, had the like awful catastrophe of the fire, um, and we see that it was like government funded to like fix and renovate it, and we see that because of that funding, this was great. A because it's a Charles Rennie Macintosh architecture, which does help define Scotland. Two, it does actually educate people, so you can actually then go and have art as a career. Um, and also it attracts like tons of tourists to the area. So under Pot's model, are we going to like stop funding? Um, and would we have just left the Glasgow Art School to derelict? Thank you. And next to you. Uh, Holly Rocks for our High School. Uh, many of the uh, identified areas of risk that have been identified this evening, such as foreign aid and poverty, are actually supported and backed by the arts. The arts don't mutually exclude anyone and, in fact, are in support of the needy. I have three examples of this. Art is normally the first thing to go when funding is cut anywhere. So why is it fair that the, these same people who are reaping the benefits of the welfare state when times get slightly tough are allowed to return to and demoralise the profession by using it to save themselves? What is busking on the streets, I ask you, when you see people playing guitar and, in fact, receiving money to help themselves out of a sticky situation? My second example would be children in need. The needy and, in fact, foreign aid reap the benefits of art. We have filmmakers, producers, directors, actors, singers putting their plethora of talent to help foreign aid, not to help themselves. None of the money from children in need actually goes back to these talented individuals. And my third example would be projects where actually the arts haven't been funded by the government, whereas they've actually fundraised it by themselves. Projects like the Mary Leishman Award, where they go out and fundraise all year to 
um, have a high enough income that they can actually give grants to people from working class backgrounds who don't have enough to pay for things like instruments or transports to art galleries. Projects like these aren't actually already funded by the government, showing that there are already things that are perpetuating themselves and as it is, the arts are, as are at risk enough that they have to do this. Without help from the government, these projects will fail to exist. Thank you. Many thanks. Um, okay, this is getting hard because we're going to run out of time. So, young man at the end here, please. Hi, I'm Ethan Martin from Linlithgow Academy. Uh, Peter from the opposition mentioned Manchester, Newcastle, Glasgow as cities that suffer a lot of social deprivation. Surely that's a good argument for making cuts somewhere in order to provide some sort of funds in order to help those cities develop. If you look at Liverpool, it received £840 million in EU regional development funding during its 2000-2006 budget. And as a result of that funding, Liverpool's GDP, in terms, in comparison with the European national average, went up from 70% in 1994 to 80% in 2012. Now, I'm not saying Liverpool is perfect. Of course it's not. There's still lots of social deprivation in Liverpool. But because that regional development funding helps the city centre and the docks um, improve, improve massively, if we were to recreate that in many cities, not just in Scotland like Glasgow and Dundee, but in other cities in the north of England like Manchester and Newcastle and Leeds, then it would surely have and then it surely would have a great positive effect. And it, it is probably best to, if you're making, having to make cuts somewhere in order to pay for that funding, I'd prefer, I'd prefer those cuts to come from the arts rather than the health service or education or the police. Thank you very much. I can only take a couple more speakers. I ask you to keep to under a minute if I call you right at the front here, please. Hi, I'm Daniel and I'm from Queensbury High School and all I'd like to say is that in the modern world the arts cannot exempt itself from the competitive society we have, it cannot exempt itself from the free market that we have and it cannot exempt itself from the power of those markets. If it's not sustaining itself, it's not the duty of the taxpayers or the governments to fund it more, it's the duty of itself to realise that if the public don't like it or if the public don't like a particular art, it is subjective and it cannot exempt itself from the modern society. Many thanks. Here. Can we have the microphone, please, for this young woman? Thank you. Uh, it's all, um, Anna Morton from Whitburn Academy. Um, George Orwell's 1984 demonstrates a model of a world without art. Cutting art fundings is the first step towards this. Imagine your home, your workplace, even this place, um, without art, um, sculptures, paintings, etc. Would you really like to live in a world without colour or art? I know I wouldn't. Um, whilst it's important to fund schools, without art there would be no school, like no, nothing to look at to study, without no poems to study, which I am in English right now and enjoying very much, um, movies to learn from. There would be no creativity. No arts means nothing to study or learn from. It means taking towards dystopia. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, just here with the red lanyard, please. Yep. Um, Could we have the microphone? Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Kindred Whirl from Hindon Secondary School. I'd just like to uh, pick up on a point that the opposition made, saying that many of our national heroes are artists. However, what we neglected to take into account is that all those artists were not state funded. People like Robert Burns and Rennie McIntosh received no state funding. And that brings me on to another point, but many of the great pieces of art throughout history were produced by people and in periods where nothing was state funded. People like Picasso were not state funded. Many of the artists of the Renaissance and medieval era all had to find their own private funding. And I see no reason why that can't still be the case. Many thanks. Um, right at the back here, please. Thank you. Um, it was mentioned, well, Rebecca Miller from Whitburn Academy. It was mentioned by the proposition that um, support should be given to an art that appeals to the majority of people, this art being chosen by the upper class white businessmen. Um, however, I'd just like to point out that 
out of these upper-class white businessmen, you could have some who would prefer a form of street art, just like you could have a gang member who prefers opera. Um, this shows how you can't make a majority out of something as widespread and unique as art. Thank you very much. Um, just here, thank you. Second row, young man, yep. Uh, Kerso from Lindsay Academy. Um, would both sides of the debate not agree that it's almost uh, very difficult, if not impossible, to decide what is actually economically productive or uh, get, brings growth? Uh, arts uh, art centres, for example, employ cleaners, employ receptionists. These people get money, they spend it in shops, therefore it gets taxed at every stage, as you said. So it's almost impossible to actually say what is economic, economically productive. So I think that uh, both sides of the, uh, the debate will have to accept that at one point. Thank you very much. Um, Right at the back here, please. Uh, um, Oliver Bond from Moore College again. Oh, sorry, did I already call you? Yes, yeah, it's, th it's not a problem, honestly. <laughs> no, it is a problem because there's so many other people want to be called. I do apologise. I'm going to have to call someone else. Sorry. Yeah, there you go. Can we have the microphone? Thank you. Uh, Matthew McMillan, Woodmill High School. Um, we also feel the arts, um, as it is like, as it brought up brilliantly by yourself earlier on, the arts as a illuminate learning. They are a learning process. As a, as a society, we grow as we learn. Everyone from all ages, from primary school to high school, university, further on in life. As a, Scotland is one of the most leading nations for the arts. We rank even high among the US, Europe, all these countries. An example of this that happened recently was the Edinburgh Festival, which also acts as a platform for, as mentioned by the team Zellard on, both conventional and minority artists to take a place and have their say. And as I said, this festival raised over £1 billion recently. Thank you. Thank you very much. I can only take one more person, um, and please not somebody that's been called before. So, young woman here, please, with the red lanyard. Yeah. Um, Christina Haas. Christina Haston and Lithgow Academy. Um, I'd just like to make the point that I feel the debate didn't address um, in that um, much of UK's um, money that they earn or get um, comes from tourism. And tourists come to the UK because of art, because of culture, because of historical sites. And I feel that reducing the amount of money that is funded into this would therefore reduce the amount of tourists thus attracted. So therefore, um, what originally was hoped to influence and gain money would then not actually work and it would be, Britain would be less well off. I'd also like to add that um, it is a basic, well not basic, but it is a human right to be able to culturally enrich yourself and by failing to fund this then they're failing to, if the government is providing a welfare state, they're failing to, um, they're failing to uh, enrich the people in that if they want to be able to go to these art galleries, they will not be able to because there's not enough funding given to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm so sorry I couldn't take everyone. And also, we clearly don't have time to go back to um, our teams, I'm afraid, for any, any comments on that. I think the judges are ready. Um, We've obviously got some strong views on the subject, and so it's a shame that we didn't have more time, but I was getting an indication from the back that the judges were ready. Because if they're not... Well, since the judges are not yet back, I am going to take another couple of contributions. Just here. Thank you. Um, my name's Ryan Miller. I'm from St Leonard's. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Madam Chair, I'm quite frankly shocked that the people in this debating chamber honestly believe that art is more important than, than feeding families, in a sense. I, perhaps one day I will decide to oppose this motion, but to, in this day, while the statistics of people below the poverty line are one in five, this motion should, is clearly very one-sided, in my opinion. I believe that families should be given this money rather than this art industry. Thank you. Thank you. And a final speaker, young woman. 
you want to stand up, I think the microphone will come on for you. All right. Thank um, you. Holly McGoldrick, Whitburn Academy. The arts have helped shape the world and society as we see it today. People travel all over the world to see different types of art, like um, opera and paintings and music. Um, so if we cut funding, tourism may fall because no one will come to see Britain's rich culture. Britain has always had a rich foundation in the arts, which people travel miles and miles to see. If we, comf if we cut funding, we're putting the future of tourism and the arts in danger, and we also risk spoiling the memory of the arts from our past. Thank you very much. This 20 minutes is growing even longer since I don't see our judges. So... So, right at the back, both of you, one after the other, please. Um, I believe that the... Sorry. I believe that, um, my name is Leora Wadler. I'm from James Gillespie's High School. And I believe the proposition argument falls down on two main points. One, they are underestimating the power of art, but given there's limited time, and that's been dealt with very well. I'll move on to the second. Two, you are overestimating the power of arts funding. You're confusing destroying a large portion of, portion of arts funding with eradicating poverty. In reality, poverty is a huge overarching problem. With, even with the extra funding, it is not going to disappear. We are not going to notice a huge difference. What we are going to notice the difference is, is the vast drop in cultural diversity we're lucky enough to benefit from today. Thank you. And next to you. Hi, Jack Richardson, James Gillespie's. I think the main fault that has been ignored in the proposition's logic is that by taking away money from arts funding, which is already at such a minimal level, we're not giving people money to go out and see plays. We're taking away the opportunity for them to see something unique, something original, something that could change their perspective on how they perceive the world. What could be more important than that? As a democratic society, we cannot let the rights of the minorities be governed by the whims of the majority. So I see no need why we can take away the right to self-expression from the minority because of the whims of a capitalist framework that has neglected to help and has failed the oppressed and downtrodden in this country. Thank you very much. And as the judges take their seats, I could take one final contribution. Uh, have you spoken before? Sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Cameron Craig, St Andrews University. Um, I think Duncan's argument very well illustrates the importance of opposition. But even when we take what the proposition states at its highest level, whereby they say that like, if um, we eradicate poverty, that's worth getting rid of the arts, you have to prove that you will eradicate poverty. You have to prove that taking away all funding from the arts is going to like, have some meaningful and tangible benefit for like, the vast majority of people. We think, Deputy Presiding Officer, at the point of which like, the amount of money that you get from arts funding is so minuscule, is so, like, such a small amount of money in the comparison to like, like HS2, which is a multi-billion pound project. We don't think that they have proved their own case that they've set themselves. Therefore, despite the fact that we like tongues, Deputy Presiding Officer, we still think the proposition fall on their own counts, and that's why you should vote opposition. Thank you very much for all of those contributions. Um, I think clearly the judges had a difficult time as well, since they went somewhat over their allocated time in coming to a decision. Um, the quality of this debate has been absolutely fantastic. And uh, I think right through, I'm extremely impressed and I want to applaud everyone for their efforts all through today and finally in this chamber. And once again, apologies that I couldn't call everyone who wanted to contribute at the end there, so sorry. Right, I'm just taking one moment to get this right, and because I don't want to call out the wrong names, obviously. And then I will be telling you who your winners are.
Sorry, I had also a floor speaker to choose um, as a winner, so apologies for that. So, right. Sorry, slight change of plan. I think I'm supposed to go down to the lectern. Apologies there, that all got slightly um, confusing at the end. So I'm now going to announce the winners of the 2014 Andrews Day Debating Championship final. And when I call your name, I'd be grateful if you could join me and Robin Harper uh, on the chamber floor to receive your prize. And we're also going to take a photograph before you move back to your seat. So... want to get this right. <laughs> right. So the first prize goes to the best university speaker of the day and that is David McCreath from Edinburgh University. <laughs> And the second prize goes to the best school speaker of the day, and that is Ellie McCreath from <laughs> And after a very difficult um, decision, the best contribution from the floor goes to Anna Martin from Whitburn Academy. And so, after the well-fought final, the runner-up of the 2014 St Andrews Day Debating Championship goes to Aberdeen McCreath, Ailey McCreath. <laughs> Sorry, and David McCreath. <laughs> And the winner of the 2014 St Andrews Day Debating Championship goes to Hindland Dyer, Martin Monaghan from Joe Dyer.
Thank you. So, I'm now going to invite Stephen O'Rourke on behalf of the English Speaking Union to say a few words. Um, Stephen has developed a broad civil and commercial practice over 10 years at the bar. He has appeared for clients in cases heard before the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom and the inner and outer houses of the Court of Session, and he's also a standing junior to the Advocate General for Scotland. Stephen, could you come and say a few words, please? Deputy Presiding Officer, ladies and gentlemen, uh, after the day that I've participated in, I feel vastly underqualified to speak here. Uh, an incredible display of talent um, and a big round of applause to all of you, first of all, who have participated in this day. Uh, it, is, it is clear that the art of debate and democracy has a beating heart here in Scotland. And it is, it is very heartening to see so many of you, Scotland's young people, uh, participating here. So a round of applause to you. It's been a very long day. I think most, if not all of us, uh, have been here since before nine o'clock. So don't worry, I'm not going to speak for very long. Um, all I want to really say is, on behalf of ESU Scotland, a big thank you, first of all, to the Scottish Parliament for hosting us and to Education Scotland for helping with the budget. A big thank you also to the panel of judges in the final uh, this evening, Alex Orr, Robin Harper, Ian McGill, Adam Bernstein and Victoria Groom and all who have given their time and expertise judging the many rounds held earlier in the day. I'd like to thank all the volunteers who helped chair the debates in all the committee rooms. I'd like to thank the students from universities across Scotland who have contributed so much to the success of this event. And most particularly, again, I'd like to thank the schools and you, the, the school pupils, who have travelled from near and far to participate in the event. With particular thanks to all the school speakers, the pupil judges and the teachers. Thank you to them. Thank you to the teachers for all of your hard work and working together with your teams uh, in the schools. It's hugely appreciated. And finally, for putting together what is an extremely challenging uh, competition and day of proceedings, as you can imagine, here at the Parliament. I'd like to thank the ESU staff uh, for all their organisation skills, and in particular, although they don't want me to name them, Fiona and Simon. <laughs> and so with that, I just wish you all a, a safe uh, uh, homeward journey, and um, here's to next year's competition. Thank you. Before you all leave, could I ask you to remain where you are for a moment because we now have to have winners and judges um, on the floor, please. We're going to have a few photographs before everyone leaves. So if we could bring winners and judges to the floor, please.
Can I just say a final thanks to everyone before you leave? Um, I think everyone's are winners in this because you've all participated all day. You've been able to take part in a, in a debate in the Scottish Parliament and I just think everyone has made a fantastic contribution. So thank you all very much and a safe journey home. Please listen to the events assistance tool tell you how to leave the chamber safely. Thank you once again. Thank you. Can you all exit from the back of the chamber, please?